to the 28th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Grossman, or as my friends call me, JAG. I have the privilege of running the Atlas Society, which as many of you know, is the leading nonprofit engaging young people with the ideas of Ayn Rand in creative ways. So uh, today we are joined by one of our trustees, Frank Brooks. Before I even get into introducing Frank, I wanna remind all of you, you can ask your questions. Please just go ahead, type them on in to the Q&A section of the Zoom chat. And for all of you watching us on YouTube, just go ahead and type them into the comment screen. We will get to as many of them as possible. So in introducing Frank, um, who's been a trustee of the Atlas Society for over a dozen years, I wanted to touch on a little bit of the secret sauce of the Atlas Society. Yes, we have a culture of creativity and innovation. Yes, we have really awesome partners who help us amplify our content to other audiences. Um, but we also have another ingredient which is perhaps less noted and that is our spectacular board of trustees. Um, they are like characters right out of Atlas Shrugged. And you've already met some of them. Jay LaPere, who is our very own Hank Reardon. Peter Copsis, who's many things, but uh, also a bit of a modern day um, Midas Mulligan. And now it is my great honor to introduce someone that I like to think of a little bit like our uh, own Howard Work. Frank is an architect who has been personally responsible for the planning and design of facilities um, with a total construction value of over $2 billion. For, the, for over 20 years, uh, he was managing principal, CEO of um, Morgan uh, Freeman White, which is a uh, design firm that specializes in the healthcare industry. And uh, he coordinated the sale of that in 2015 to the Haskell Group, where he chairs uh, their healthcare senior advisory, sector advisory board, and their design excellence initiative. While he's uh, been the architect and engineering mind behind the construction of many magnificent buildings, uh, he's also the architect and engineer of a corporate culture uh, based on independence and res responsibility, which may be why Modern Healthcare Magazine regularly cites um, his company as among the best places to work. So Frank, welcome again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jack. Happy to be here. All right, so this is a question I usually, you know, in my delayed gratification, I save to the very end, like that morsel that you, uh, you're you waiting to eat. But with you, I get to ask it right up at the top. Um, and that is, I would love to know your Ayn Rand origin story. How did you get interested and become so passionate about <laughs> the, the work and uh, the impact of the ideas of Ayn Rand? Well, uh... Well, thank you, Jack, and thanks for that introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, my origin story, my Ayn Rand origin story started when I was pretty young, uh, as it happens with a lot of us. I have had an older brother who had been to college. He's about four years older. He, I think, as I recall, he came home, I was sitting on the bed and he threw a book to me and said, read that. I went, okay. You know, what I do? My big brother told me to read this. It was Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, which is a collection of essays many of you know about capitalism, about the gold standard. It was, I was absorbed. It was like, holy cow, this is great. And I was, I think I was probably 10th grade, maybe something like that. Maybe between ninth and 10th, I can't remember. But uh, so I read that. So my introduction was not through the fiction. It was through, through the nonfiction. I, sh I followed that probably shortly, as I recall, with the virtue of selfishness. And, you know, I was hooked. It was, I uh, probably went on to read The Fountainhead while in high school. And I, know, I do remember reading Atlas Shrugged like the summer before I went to college because I was working a summer job and every break I had, I was looking at the book and reading, reading Atlas Shrugged to see what happened, you know? So 
if I can continue a little bit on this. Um, so some interesting, you, you mentioned Jay LaPere. So I have a story about Jay. And uh, so one of my best friends in high school was a gentleman named Jerry, isn't it? Jerry Brooks is his name. We played basketball together, came up from elementary school and Jerry was a great basketball player. And we, we were good buddies. So I introduced him to Rand at high school and you know, he's a smart guy, pretty smarter than me. And he's, uh, he absorbed all that. And lo and behold, he ends up going to the University of Texas on a basketball scholarship. And who is his roommate sophomore year, but Jay LaPere. And so he and Jay, as you had in college, those, those sessions you'd have discussing every idea in the world. And apparently, according to Jay, he tells the story, I wasn't there, he tells the story that Jerry got frustrated and said, you know, you're just too ignorant for me to talk to. So you need to read some books. So here's a stack of Rand books. Here's some von Mises books. Read those and come back and we'll talk. And so apparently that was Jay's introduction to objectivism, which took pretty well with him because he's an amazing, amazing person anyway, but has, has come to the to chair the, and does a fantastic job chairing our organization. So you never know where the influences are gonna come from. My brother to me, me to Jerry, Jerry to Jay, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. So interesting connections. And, you know, Jay and I didn't actually meet at the University of Texas. We met later at an objectivist conference and made that connection and went, really? We had a friend in common, a good friend for both of us that we never really made that connection before. Very interesting. So anyway, that's my extended story. <laughs> well, it, it is so fascinating and it's been such a privilege for me to, to get to know the people that have been a part of the Out Society community for you know 30 years now. Um, and uh, that's just one of the biggest perks of Running the Outlet Society is that our donors, uh, many of whom have joined us uh, for this webinar, are just all really interesting people doing interesting things. Um, speaking of, how, what, what then led you to uh, your chosen profession? Well, that's another story. So I, you know, ended up going to the University of Texas, and at, you know, at that. Uh, <clears throat> I went to school, I really didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do. So I get through, you know, freshman year, sophomore year. And at some point I went, you know, maybe I ought to take this more seriously and figure out what I, what I ought to be doing with my life. And uh, I remember back, my mother was a, was a high school art teacher. And so I grew up drawing and sketching and doing all that. I actually designed some little buildings and stuff when I was a kid. And my dad was a CPA, so he had that kind of analytical piece. And uh, I remember going up with my mom to, the high school and sorting through work that our students had done and we would fire the the kill up and you know do the uh, clay stuff for so i did all that kind of coming up but um at this point in college I, I decided well you know i need to think about who i am and what i'm doing and i've been having a great time but maybe it's time to think about something so and this is where the story gets really stupid i I sat down and did an assessment. I went, remember that architecture stuff? You know, yeah, I really like that. And, you know, I love a lot of things, I have broad interests. And I'm pretty good at a lot of things, but nothing stood out that I was fantastic at, you know, mathematics or anything else. So it was like, I thought architecture, you know, I re that's, that was something that really interested me. So this is how uninformed I was. I didn't go to the architecture school. I sat down and took all the curriculum books the university had and created my own course curriculum and said, this is what would make me a good architect. It involved all the stuff I loved, you know, the psychology of perception and all these things I, I was into at the time. And I took it to the counselor and said, hey, I think I wanna be an architect. This is what I wanna do. And fortunately she didn't laugh at me. She said, oh, this is pretty interesting. So lo and behold, the next semester, I was accepted into the School of Architecture. And started it as a junior and uh, one of the best things I've ever done in my life. It changed the course of my life. It, my first design course just lit me up and it was like, oh, this is me. This is what I need to be doing. And interestingly enough, that, that sort of choice has led to so much joy in my life. And it not only provided for our, for my you know, for everything in my life, you know, from running companies to making an income and but the enjoyment I've gotten out of that, that process, I'm one of those fortunate people that really loves what I do and always have. And it's, as you mentioned, it's, it's the design piece, but it's also, I had the 
the good fortune to help develop and run a company, to have partners, to have clients, to have an organization. And I think at our largest size, we were you know, two, 250 people, something like that. But to be able to organize and steer that and, and apply the things I learned about corporate culture, that's a whole other story, but in applying the values that I really picked up probably from my parents and from Rand and from a lot of people, but those, those virtues of individualism and self-respect and self-starving and taking responsibility and taking it, being able to weave that into a corporate culture was very gratifying for me. Well, I'm going to follow up with that question um, but I want to encourage all of you who are watching us on YouTube, uh, those who are with us on Zoom, please take advantage of this really wonderful opportunity that we have with uh, Frank Brooks, amazing architect and uh, longtime trustee of the Atlas Society. And what you were saying, uh, Frank, really resonated with me that, you know, it, in college, it wasn't like you were not good at anything, and this was the only thing that you were good at. And um, we have a lot of young people that are involved with the Atlas Society and they're trying to figure out, you know, who are they? What do they want to do with their life? What should they do? Um, and, uh, you know, they're very talented young people. And sometimes when you're good at a lot of things, it, it is a good thing to, to, to have that multifunctionality and, and a diverse skill set. But sometimes when you have a lot of strengths, they can actually um, not put you directly onto your career path, you know, or that your purpose in life, because if somebody says, write something, you write it, you're good at that. They say, you know, manage something and you're good at that. And so you, you might end up just doing whatever it was that was the first thing that you tried that you were good at, you know, rather than um, moving on to the thing that you, you really love and the thing that you would do, you know, if, uh, if you weren't getting paid for it. Yeah, I think, you know, is there a question I can address some of that, but the, uh, you know, just because you pick a particular direction, in my case, it was architecture and design, but as far as communications, speaking before groups, mm -hmm. you know, I developed a talent in that and can do that, but I was able to exercise that in this profession. Writing, I, I write a lot because I, I had to, and I taught myself how to do it better. And so I had an outlet for that as well. Kind of intellectual endeavors, or learning about, in my case, the healthcare business and, and being able to learn about other industries and, and always keeping a new horizon. My, my career arc has never been the same. It, it changes and you can shape your career arc as you go. So to make a point, make a choice, it's not necessarily excluding other choices as you go. You can craft it into what you want. And that, that's the power of choice. It's the power of guiding your own life and understanding that you have that power to change it. It's not like you're gonna get locked in. I mean, you can always change at any time. I do think you have to take its best. And it, when you're young, it's the time to, check, to try a bunch of stuff, right? That's what we all do. That's what that time is for. But listening to yourself and trying to really see how you respond, being that, that self-awareness of knowing when I went in there and saw some of that, I went, oh, this is really clicking with me, you know? And I really feel good doing this. Or I feel maybe it was a struggle, but I would accomplish something. Go, oh, God, that, that's great. And be proud of it. A lot of failure, but a lot of success too. But the, uh, so anyway, that's the only, only touchstones I can give for that. You're shaping your own life, but if you do need to commit at some point to get deep enough because the richness comes from the depth. It doesn't come from the surface, even though there's a lot, there's fun to gain at the surface, but the richness comes from committing and going deep into a subject. Yeah. Um, so I have definitely done a lot of uh, different things in, in my career and ended up spending uh, a, over a decade working at a food company, Dole Food Company. And um, my grandmother at the time, she said, my, my father said, oh my, it's so strange. I never thought my daughter, I thought she'd go into politics or that she would end up working at a, a food company. And uh, my grandmother, 
um, who died before her time at 99 years of age, she said, it's still early days. So I think to kind of dovetail into what you're saying that, uh, that young people shouldn't feel locked in. They started out in this profession. And also I think that's something that Ayn Rand's uh, philosophy provides, which is an independence and not um, feeling that you need to be dependent on what other people's expectations um, are of you. So, uh, so Frank, and again, I wanna encourage the audience to, to ask questions. I am fascinated by uh, business and I'm particularly interested in uh, how you took, it wasn't, you know, I work with a lot of architects, they you know, do one building after another, but you really uh, um, grew this into uh, an, an industry that was focused on um, healthcare facilities, not just providing the design and helping with the building, but also Strategy, how did that uh, spe specialization um, in terms of designing medical facilities, how did it begin and how did it grow to encompass those other services? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think it's an interesting story. So uh, <laughs> yeah. it started because, you know, we were a regional firm, not a large firm, and we wanted to grow and uh and I was always reading things, and I came across a book called uh, Marketing Warfare by Reese and Trout, who were, who were branding specialists out of Atlanta. And they'd written a lot of books. And I picked this book up called Marketing Warfare. And it was about niche markets. And I go, oh, that's interesting. So it's a short book. I took through it, and it was based on von Clausewitz, you know, on war. They took the war metaphor and applied it to marketing and niche marketing and sales. And the part that they were talking about was a smaller organization attacking a larger force. And if you think of a, you know, a larger army in front of you, you can't, you can't match up frontal attack to frontal attack. So you would have to gather your forces and puncture the line, right? So you, that's the niche market. You gather your forces, you focus on one thing and you extend. So I had a great partner at the time and uh, John Huddy and, uh, I'd read this book and I told him about it. I said, you know, we need to go narrow and deep. We need to understand everything there is about something. And we know healthcare and we, we're narrow on that, but let's go a little deeper. And uh, so I said, what have you done some of lately? What kind of projects? He said, well, I've done some emergency departments. I said, well, I have too. You know, we've done, I've done a bunch of those. He's done a bunch of those. I said, okay, let's do that. You know, that's something we can start with. Let's try it. And he was, John is some <laughs> brilliant marketing guy. And so we come up, we talk about it, we come up with this idea, we're gonna go and pitch this to the, uh, the American Nurses Association that's having a meeting in Nashville. So we, we, we booked ourselves as emergency department experts, got a booth and went and showed our projects and really just from an architectural standpoint. And the nurses would come by and we realized that you know, everybody likes chocolate, Hershey Kisses, nurses in particular. We put a lot of those chocolates out there. They all came, oh, you're the ones with the chocolate. So we got a lot of traffic. There's sort of like 3,000 nurses at the Opryland Hotel at the time. So uh, a nurse came up and said, well, you're experts in this. Obviously, you have a nurse on your team. We said, you know, we're looking for a nurse right now because we want that clinical expertise. We ended up hiring her. We started looking at the clinical operations and... She said, well, you guys do any, you know, simulations? We go, you know, we're looking at that too. So we, <laughs> we, we got some software that we took from the automotive industry. It's called Witness at the time. And we modified it to model, to do simulations, computer simulations of healthcare operations. And that idea of this niche market was able to take us and expand us beyond just facility design to operational and clinical redesign and, and into modeling and eventually into strategy and positioning. So it affected, it kind of affected our whole company. That particular thing took us to start applying that technique across other sectors within our company, other departmental areas, whether it's surgery or cardiovascular, whatever it might've been. So it was an insight from a book and applying it and taking, taking a flyer at it and seeing if we could do something with it. And we were able to, and it did take us national. So it, it caused a big growth spurt and 
we became that became our identity for a long time, for better or worse. And anyway, so that's how that happened. Well, speaking of uh, insights from a, a book, and I, you know, I, I've got to uh, read that that book that uh, that you're talking about because I think that that's an old one. It's been around a while. Well, you know, <laughs> sometimes there's five years ago. <laughs> Our, our cliche, I mean, Clausewitz, he's been around for a while, but uh, yeah. he's, he's worth rereading every once in a while. Um, so I'm good. I have a bunch of other questions, but I want to sprinkle a few in as we get them from our audience. Robert Smith uh, has a question for you. He says, Frank, in your architectural career and your, did you, did you experience anything in the industry that uh, reminded you of the challenges Howard Rourke faced in Fountainhead? Good question. Well, I can't say exactly like that. I mean, being told not to design something or not having it accepted, you know, healthcare is so functionally driven. There's a lot of kind of purpose behind everything that you do. There's always stylistic challenges and you do have challenges where people don't want to do very good design. A lot of it's budget driven. So there is some of that. And you, you learn in the business, you, you know, when I'd have a difficult client, I'd always make sure that I was giving them my straight up advice with unvarnished. Here's what it is. Here's what I think you should do. I would tell them two or three times. And at some point I learned from one of my first really big clients and a great client I told, uh, his name was Ray Champ. I told Mr. Champ a couple of times, I disagreed with him on something. About the third time he said, okay, Frank, I've heard you. So now we're gonna do it my way. I'm the owner, <laughs> we're gonna go this way. I went, yes, sir, I got it. So I think there's a line you walk and I never had the crisis in, in principle, I think that Howard Rourke had and some of the, the narratives of that. So I can't say that I had directly, even though I think you do have to learn how to sell and promote your work to get the best outcomes. Robert, I hope that answers that, but that's as close as I can come. So that is a great question about the fountainhead. Um, I think more in a way applicable might be Atlas Shrugged and some of the most recognizable characters that Rand creates are villains uh, that are crony capitalists that are colluding with government to gain an unfair advantage rather than competing in uh, the free market. Um, certainly there's so much regulation in the, the hospital um, industry, particularly the construction of hospitals. Um, my dad was just talking about early days uh, when he was at the Beth Israel and how the people that would be on the board of these associations that would be in a position to license, you know, whether or not a new hospital could be built. So uh, does any of that seem familiar? Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course it does. The, uh, you know, unfortunately, healthcare is highly regulated and it's, it has some specific laws that have to do with access and building, et cetera. But not unlike a lot of other industries, I think of banking or the airlines and a lot of the regula regulations that go into those, but healthcare is more, I believe. And the primary cul culprit regarding protectionism is the certificate of need laws. Yeah. And they're in probably 35 states now. Uh, they've reduced some, some states have done away with them. A lot of people do recognize that that's protectionism for large institutions, large healthcare institutions. That's how they keep the, the doctors from competing with the hospital. They have to have a CON. So there's a lot of that, but interestingly enough, and, and, and that does happen and it's prevalent. And I've worked with a lot of large systems and they certainly use that. But a lot of times they're using against the, if they're the 800 pound gorilla, there's a 700 pound gorilla across the across the river that they're competing with. So they're both jockeying for position. I do find that the entrepreneurs and businessmen find ways around a lot of this stuff. You know, you put the, the roadblock up, they'll find a way around, specialty hospitals, ambulatory care facilities. Now, the regulatory regime will respond to that, but they're kind of slow to respond. So there's things that can happen. So yeah, I absolutely see it. I think the market forces are 
relentless and people are smart and they figure out ways around a lot of it. So I've seen both. And, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of hospitals that got their CONs and, you know, protected their turf. But I also saw how competitive it is. Even with all that, it's extremely competitive on most every area. And uh, so I think the thing about the regu regulations that uh, hospitals face, you know, they, they get so many payments from Medicare and Medicaid. That's a, their largest income for a lot of hospitals. So they basically have golden handcuffs. They get all this funding from the federal government. The federal government tells them how to operate everything, right? And so they have a lot of edicts about clinical process, about a lot of things, regulations they have to do, things they have to do, have to, procedures the way they do things. And, you know, some of it is useful, I guess, but a lot of it isn't. And the same with construction codes. A lot of them are very well thought out, very particular. Some seem kind of crazy. In any human endeavor, you can work through a system, you figure it out, but it makes it more difficult and more costly. That's the bottom line. So speaking of um, construction, uh, we, were struggling to put on a successful gala, which we accomplished back in October in Malibu. And thank you very much, Frank, for coming to that. And uh, it was you, fun. It was so much fun. It, it was, was great. Was, year is not yet over, but it is going to be hard to, to top that experience. We're getting um, 140, 150 people at an event live. It was fantastic. Great job, Jack. Great job with the team. It was amazing. It was, it was so much fun, but you know, there were times when I was, uh, I was getting no's from everyone. You can't do this. It's not possible. You have to go for completely virtual. And I just said, I'm, I, like we're gonna find ways as an entrepreneur, we're going to find ways to work around it, work under it, work aside, and just, we're gonna just keep going. There's nothing that they're gonna put, you know, in, in front of us that is gonna make us uh, stop finding a way to, to, to do this. One of the things though that you had said, which really helped me keep going at the time um, was you said, look, I'm on construction sites, you know, all the time in different states, this is happening, they are, finding ways, you know, to be safe and yet um, move forward. Uh, are, there, are there things that um, the development construction uh, industry procedures that they have adopted that might be useful to other sectors? Uh, well, I do remember all these conversations we had. And I was speaking in particular of, of the project I'm doing in Jacksonville, Florida. It's a large hospital project, about 250,000 feet of construction. Uh, and I'll throw some names out there because these are great folks. I'm working with a construction company, our company, Freeman Weiss, working with DPR, which is one of the large construction companies, healthcare construction companies in the country. Fantastic guys. And my company, Haskell, the, my acquiring company, does hospitals as well. They're contractors. So I can speak for both Haskell and DPR. They're obsessed with job safety. Haskell, our company, we measure it. We look at it. We're obsessed about it. And rightfully so. And right. we look at safety from all aspects and we track it, have the metrics on it. DPR does the same thing. So there's a culture of safety. So that's one thing to start with. I think the other thing to realize about large contractors and architectural firms and these things that we're doing to build this, this stuff doesn't happen by accident. It's very intentional. Everything is intentional, everything is planned, everything is scheduled. It's constantly changing because vendor supplies, weather access always changes, so you're always on top of it. But I think the key is, certainly on the COVID and all this other stuff, the magic is there's no magic. The magic is <laughs> there's no magic because it's attention to detail, it's hard work, it's discipline. It's the things that good people do anyway. So, we've a, so we have site control and access. So we, what the site is restricted access. That's one thing, you get restricted access. You're scheduling work. 
so that you know when people are coming, you're keeping distances, you're doing things that most people are doing now, whether it's temperature checks, questionnaires, masks, hand cleaning, distance on the job. But again, having the discipline to do it, to check it, to, to monitor it. We have had very few incidents on our site. I don't know if we've had any COVID. I know some of the, some of the Haskell projects have had some COVID related incidents, but then they're quarantined for two weeks and people are on top of it and dealing with it. And if I may, just editorial comment, this nanny state approach, you know, the founders didn't say you have free speech, you have property rights, you have freedom to assembly, unless there's a pandemic. That doesn't say that. It says you have that. They knew about pandemics. This isn't anything new to them. They relied upon the citizens' intelligence, good judgment, and freedom to address these things, much like I just talked about, that rational people can assess the risk. They can do the things necessary to accomplish the task at hand. And that's what we do on job sites. That's what we do in a lot of job sites. Now, do we tune back the number of people on the site? Yeah, we have over 100, 150 people on the site sometimes, but you can dial it back to, to make sure you keep the spacing and the safety, et cetera. So the magic is there's no magic. It's hard planning, discipline, focus, and intentionality. Atlas Society Gremlins, make sure that you caught, that is the sound bite. <laughs> that is a set for memeing and video memeing because uh, the magic is, there's no magic. And you know, that's I think interesting because a lot of times it can look like magic or it can feel like magic when you don't understand how did you do that, you know? But, um, but it, it isn't magic, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of attention uh, to detail. And of course, you know, there's, there's creativity. And as you mentioned, culture, creating a culture, a culture of safety with, within your company. I, we have a question from uh, uh, Vicki asking about her 21 year old son who started his own business um, with partners. And one of the things with that, <laughs> yeah, with partners so that he's struggling with is getting partners to be independent, to take action, to take responsibility. What advice uh, would you have for a young person getting started in creating a culture? And how did that come on your radar uh, in terms of what you did at your own company? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of questions in there, Jack. So the, uh, uh, let me go about the partners first. You know, one of the things about any partners and partnerships, and I've been in multiple ones, I'm in some now with other business ventures. The first thing is alignment around common purpose and values. And you need frank discussions at the beginning of the partnership to understand where you're all headed and what you want to accomplish. That's number one. You, you, need, you need conscious alignment. So that's the first thing. If you're having problems with partners, those conversations need to happen. And they need to happen in a straightforward, respectful way. Let's make sure we're all on the same page and pulling the same direction. I learned that in the School of Hard Knocks. I can tell you that when I had two partners and they were a little older than myself and they had a different vision of our future than I did. And it just didn't work out for that reason. I still remain friends. We had some difficult times, but I learned it from not having those conversations and just thinking, hey, our friendship will carry it through because we're such great buddies, right? It's not about that. It has to be aligned and intentional. The uh, corporate culture thing, how did, I, <laughs> how did I think about that? Well, again, it seems like my career is scattered with serendipity and maybe it's just because I'm showing up a lot. But back in the early 90s, I had a client and they had seen us perform, you know, some of this performance art. We go in and we design with people and have orchestrate the work with the staff and a little bit of that. And you're getting people fired up about something. So he said, you know, we have another consultant that kind of does what you do, Frank. And uh, he does, he's doing organizational development for us. I went, what's that? You know, it was like 92 or something. I've never heard of that, right? Was, they were from Pepperdine, really smart guys. And professors and all sorts of stuff. So well, one guy's very charismatic guy. And he, uh, so I talked to him and he said, well, 
here's what we're doing. We're doing all this alignment from the board level to the lowest staff member. And we're getting everything aligned and we're getting values. I go, okay. So I learned about corporate culture from them. And I, I went to their sessions and I went, oh, this is what this is. It's purposeful investigation of attitudes, values, and beliefs for an organization. And then how do you get people on the same page? And they were great at it. I mean, that is something we tried to buy as company actually, yeah, wow. <laughs> but, but, it, but it didn't work out. But it, And we danced around for a year or so, but I saw a lot and we teamed with him on a lot of stuff, his company, small company. And I learned about corporate culture. And then part, part of what, she, what I picked up was it needs to be, again, that word intentional. It needs to be thoughtful and it needs to come from not just talk, but action. You need to demonstrate the values through action as every good leader does. That's good leadership. You, you know, you walk the talk, right? But what I, what I did, I used, I relied a lot upon, you know, the, the eight virtues of objectivism on all this. And I, I kind of molded a lot of it to our company and what our values needed to be in a design field. And so first thing it was our, had a clear articulation of what the values should be. And this was aspirational on my part. Nobody bought into it. I just went, oh, let's try this. And I started kind of talking that up in the office and saying, these things will be valuable to us if we all get on board. And, you know, people kind of thirsted after having that clarity. And a real insight came to me is I had all this on a board and two insights came. I, I had it on a board and that's what I talk to my staff about three insights actually. First one was, was we were growing fast. I guess that ED thing was taken off or whatever we were doing. And I was interviewing somebody and they said, what's that? I said, oh, these are our corporate values. And I went over it and they went, wow, I want to be part of that. So people started self-selecting for those values. It lit some people up, other ones it didn't. But the ones it did are the ones we wanted. And so you start this self-selection process and you start growing a culture. If you want to change corporate culture, it's easy if you grow your numbers and the new people coming in don't have any baggage. You just say, this is what it is. And they all go, okay. And they start to get, and if, it's, if it works, if it's honest, if, it's, if it has integrity, it'll start getting a fire of its own going. And that's what we did. The second thing I noticed was I had a client come in and they go, what's that? I go, oh, those are corporate values. Wow, that's great. I want to work with you guys. So it it was able, to, I was able to take it from an internal tool to an external tool and start to position our company as that company that did those things. And so it had an external value as well. Um, I think I've already covered the third. It was a self-selection thing, but it in recruiting and then self-selection. I guess the third was what I already mentioned though was if you're growing the company and changing culture, it's much easier to grow it and bring new people in than trying to change an entrenched culture. It's just easier. And because you have a lot of people that have baggage the old way and you can convert it, but it's a lot of work and you need alignment of leadership from top to bottom. And the culture, it needs to be top down and bottom up. You can't have an edict. It's got, and, and part of it comes from the way we work the senior people in the firm, we worked on projects. We worked with the young people, every level. So we were in action with our teams. We were going to dinner with our teams. We were talking with our teams all the time. So that personal involvement, and that was the virtue of being a smaller company at that time. We were able to do that. You can't do it at a larger company. You have to have different techniques. But anyway, maybe it's more than you wanted to hear on that, but that's uh, how we approach that. Well, I think it's fascinating. And, and culture is something that... Um, but I think, you know, we always say politics is downstream from culture and culture is downstream from philosophy. And I think that's true, not just for society writ large, um, but, but also organizations. And so- uh, I'll have a quote on that one. That's an old quote, everybody's probably heard it, but you know, strategy, I mean, uh, culture is strategy for lunch every day. I hadn't and, heard that one. Well, and the meaning of this, and, you know, I've heard this for a long time. It finally dawned on me what that, I, mean, I heard it from some consultant somewhere in my past, but the point being is if you have the right culture, you can adapt your strategy because mm -hmm. you, you have a culture that is active and flexible 
and focused on solutions, oriented toward the client, toward the solution. The conditions in the market can change and your strategy can tilt or move how it needs to. But if you have that culture that allows that to happen and stay on point, it's more powerful than having a fixed strategy. And that's the meaning of, of culture strategy for lunch. So, so uh, I want to go back to that question about um, a partnership that you were talking about, <laughs> intentional partnership. Um, and I want to invite all of the Atlas Society partners who are joining us for this webinar to, to bring your questions forward and take advantage of this opportunity uh, to, to get some insights from, um, from Frank. But talking about partnership, one of the things I have admired the most about you, um, and you, you know, this is not the first time you're, you're hearing this, your wife, Gail, <laughs> both of you know this, is I very much admire the partnership that you two have built. It's not just that the two of you are a gorgeous uh, couple, but um, you know, between health challenges and, and various things, you really have lived up to the, the commitments of you know, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. Um, many people interpret these as you know, religious supernatural commitments, but I'm curious to know whether objectivism has helped um, in any way in, in building a, a union, building uh, relationships that are grounded and uh, designed like a building to stand the test of time? Well, it's an interesting question. And, you know, it's, it's hard to separate who you are from philosophy sometimes. You've integrated it so much in your life, right? And so I do think on a fundamental level, objectivism certainly plays a role in that, but it's really about creating that sense of self, who you are. I mean, so much in a romantic relationship or any relationship, you know, we're all unique individuals. So, and, and, and philosophy speaks on the broadest terms, right? The largest integrations. And so individuals are very particular. <laughs> They're very particular manifestations of humans, right? And we all have our strengths and weaknesses, our capabilities or, or likes and dislikes. So ultimately I was thinking about this, you know, obviously there has to be initial chemistry. That's how relationships start. That's how they start. And that spark, that passion, that excitement of the, of the, of the relationship when it begins, but it needs to be more than that to endure. And the, uh, and I'll borrow from Brandon, I guess, through, through Ren, but uh, you know, he had the concept of visibility. One of the things that, allow people to connect is feeling visible to that person, that they understand who you are, that they get you, right? And I think that's something Gail and I certainly have. And that comes from, you know, being straightforward and honest about who we are. And I think that helps in the visibility. I think it's also just our natures to be like that. So we connected on that level. So having that visibility. So I think understanding that, I mean, whether that would happen without philosophy, probably, but you kind of understand why it's happening and how you connect. And I think on the good times, bad times thing, you know, I think, um, you know, there's the initial romantic love that goes to kind of that never leaves, but there's a companionship and partnership that evolves over time with common purpose and common goals. And the, uh, you know, Gail and I never had children. So I think a lot of couples certainly have that together to raise their children. That's a human and natural thing. And it brings you together around a common purpose of creating these wonderful, wonderful people. That's a huge and important endeavor. We didn't have that. So you find other things that you have common interest in. And whether it's helping build a bu building, a, a, a business or a building or whatever it might be, or other things that we do, or traveling and things that we enjoy. Uh, but ultimately you're about honoring each other, both apart and separately. And I think the philosophical pieces, and I, I think Rand said this, but in order to say, I love you, you gotta be able to say I. Right, so you need to understand who you are and what you're about. And I think Gail does, and I think I do. And I admire her for so many things. You know, this is another thing, and this is off topic, but 
I've also often noticed when I, at least in my younger days, I'd meet someone, I think they're extremely attractive. What an interest, you know, beautiful person. And then you get to know them and the, it just doesn't live up to the billing, right? And somehow their appearance doesn't look as good as it used to. <laughs> and the converse happens. I think, ah, you know, they're okay, but I get to know them and go, God, they're beautiful. You know, so that understanding of values and that connection of values, of commiserate values, has a lot to do with how you experience people, I believe. So, um, but I think about the, the tough times. I think part of this is very individualistic. I, a man's a, a being of self-made soul and you're always striving to be your best self. So when tough times come, we want to be our best selves. We want to be that version of the person mm -hmm. that we aspire to be. And doing that is being steadfast to your partner. It's being there for that partner. And those can be health things. It can be tough. It can be a lot of things. But if you see that as a reflection of yourself and how you respond to situations, there's nothing supernatural about it. It's about egoism. It's about being the person you can be. It's about being proud of who you are and what you've built together. So that's my answer. Yeah, um, that, that is, of course, a quote by, um, by Ayn Rand. I believe it was um, from the Fountainhead, Howard Rourke to, uh, to Dominique, you know, and, and so much of that story was her character arc evolution from being kind of neurotic and, um, and mistrustful uh, and afraid, you know, to, to embracing um, love and uh, embracing herself so that she, she, she could love. Um, so, you know, speaking of the things that, that you and, and Gail share and, and have, um, have built together, uh, you know, among the many things you and I share is of course a, a love of art and a love of architecture. And when I uh, rebuilt my house in Malibu after it burned down, I was, uh, was very much inspired by Ayn Rand. In particular, I had in mind uh, the house that she describes in um, Anthem, you know, at, at the end that they come upon this sort of abandoned house of glass. And not only did I build it with that vision in mind, then we, we got to actually you know, feature feature the um, the house in in the anthem graphic novel, which is sort of circles inside of circles. Right. Um, and uh, I understand that uh, you and Gail built a uh, design and built a house in Charlotte, and I, which I'm very much looking forward to visiting one day. And apparently, it has a garden pathway of stones with objectivist virtues. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and, and ways in which, you know, again, you talk about integrating a philosophy, how, how your, your philosophy, your appreci appreciation of Ayn Rand uh, maybe helped play into the, the house that you two designed and built together. Well, okay. I, this is a topic I can fill a little bit of time <laughs> with, but, uh, you know, we've been in this house, I oh guess, now it's been since 2004. We found a lot in Charlotte that was a find. I'll tell a little bit of a story about it. I'll get to the Stones piece. But, you know, we found we were looking for something in close to town where we lived. And we, we ended up with finding a lot about 10 or 15 minutes from up what they call uptown Charlotte. So it's, it's in the core of the city. And it was two and a half acres, surprisingly, because everybody thought it was in the floodplain. And it was in the floodplain, but just not as badly as they thought. I guess it took a crazy architect to figure out how to use it, but we did. And consequently, we had quite a bit of property. This leads to the pathway and the stones, right? So, um, so we bought the property, then we designed the house and multiple iterations of it, just trying to understand it. And I think, you know, a lot of that came from my practice as an architect. I'd done this for a long time at that point. And uh, so I had a lot of approaches, but a house is very personal. And it's a really personal manifestation. And we took it to be that. It's, it's a manifestation of the two of us. And what do we want that to be like? And so that was always kind of in our minds. And I guess that has a philosophical root to it of self-expression and some of that. So I've, that was part of it. And, you know, Ayn Rand said that 
that uh, the floor plan of a building is like the theme of the book, right? I forget which way she did it, but you're working out the plan and how you live was the first kind of the driver, kind of the heart of it. And the aesthetic style generated from the context or in the neighborhood. And it's, it's sort of a contemporary prairie home, a Frank Lloyd Wright type prairie home. But there were other examples of that in the neighborhood. So I wanted to fit the context, but kind of up the ante a little bit, which is what we did. And uh, so coming back to the site and the, the, uh, the pathway. So we had this site, we built the house on it and we got the lot for a song, which was great, but then you realize you got to drive piles because the soils aren't good, a lot of stuff. 130 piles the house sits on. And uh, the, uh, so it was kind of crazy, but even with that, it was still, still a good endeavor. So we had this land and it's along a creek. I'm looking outside, it's dark now, but I can't see it. But the, uh, the uh, property would flood, it floods a couple of times a year, but we had this low lying area and we started to clear the brush out and we have a forest behind us along the creek. And so in order to start to use that, I said, well, why don't we do a pathway? And so we have a pathway that meanders through the woods and goes across the site. And it just kept growing from there. And if you remember, I don't know if you remember this, but you know, when, when ancient Greeks would do a speech, they would walk the garden, right? So they would memorize a speech at this point in the garden, I'm speaking about this topic. When I get to here, I'm on that point. So they would practice as they went through the garden. Then when they were ready to give the speech mentally, they would just go through the garden and they always remembered everything they needed to do as a memory trick, right? So I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. So can I have a garden path that has milestones that speak of the virtues that I hold dear that were generated by Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism? So that's what we did. We went out and got boulders. I talked to my landscape guy, I said, can, can we get these engraved? I went, sure. I said, okay, well, here's what I want to engrave. So I did the eight, I did a little pithy statement with each. Mm -hmm. And of course the path starts with reason. The foundation, right? Starts with the first foundation virtue that all the others spin out from. So the next one is independence because in order to exercise reason, we know we have to have independent judgment. So you walk the path and there's independence. You go, oh, gee. That's great for thought, but what about action? So then you get to integrity, integration of thought and action. You know, thought without action doesn't mean much. You gotta, you gotta walk the talk, right? As I mentioned before. Then we go down the path to this little split in the Y and then there's honesty. Honesty is adherence to facts of reality, both internal and external. So not only having integrity, but being honest about your observation and judgment about things external. You go along the path and then you come to a, a sitting area and stone is justice. And justice is applying those terms to society, to making both benevolent calls and judgmental calls, calling things for what they are honestly and acting on those judgments. Because if you let people slide on things they shouldn't, you're penalizing the people that didn't slide on it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's doing that. So then you walk the path and then we we come to productivity and it's right down by another creek that we come to in the stone of productivity at that intersection. Along the path, we come to that resulting pride and that realization and honoring what you've accomplished and, and, and celebrating that. And then last but not least at the one termination of the, it's really the entrance, one entrance to the path and kind of going back to the reason stone, but it's another, it's kind of the, another secondary entrance is benevolence, the eighth virtue. And that's the trader principle. And that's seeking values and, and realizing values in a, in a trader society, in a social society. So it, it's kind of this whole thing that embodies our sight and embodies our belief system. And, you know, it's a little esoteric. I think friends that walk and they go, oh, that's cool. You know, but the, it doesn't have that, that meaning that goes to, there are other things along the path. We have outside sculpture, we have wind chimes, we have other things that we interact with along that pathway. So that's the pathway story. I, I, I love it. And um, I hope to see it one day. I feel like I am, uh, if not 
literally then figuratively walking on that path, you know, and that uh, that David had, that Ayn Rand, and and of course with regards to the study of objectivism and leadership, with regards to uh, objectivism and applied objectivism that David has um, blazed. And I I remember, you know, very the my first year couldn't figure out what was up, what was down, you know, what what the heck was uh, happening, and you know just even getting deeper into my understanding of, um, of objectivism, reading truth and toleration, understanding it. Like, and I'm, I remember, you know, we, and we went out very strong with the whole envy theme, envy is evil. Uh, and, it's, and it's been great. And I do remember uh, asking him, you know, well, wouldn't envy be the cardinal sin of objectivism? And uh, he said, no, no, the cardinal sin uh, would be evasion, you know? It would be evasion and it would be not being honest with yourself, not being honest, you know, with others. It would be a violation of ASA. And that that made a lot of um, a lot of sense to me. Well does. <laughs> it's, it's a fundamental truth. <laughs> yeah. So no, it's just it's interesting. You know, it is it is fundamental, but uh, I think you know, we just see such an orgy of of envy right now in our society. You see such an or, orgy of of You're greed, right. you know, the desire for the unearned. Um, and so we hit that, but I, I, I think that uh, it is important to call things what they are, but also to to offer an alternative, you know, which is a is a moral ideal. So wow, talk about time flying when uh, when you're having fun. Um, we the other questions we, we didn't get to, but uh, Frank, let me tell tell me if there's anything that that you feel we didn't touch on that that's been you know, on your mind or, or, or why you're so passionate about uh, the Atlas Society and the work you do? Well, I think just in, in brief, uh, this manifestation of values and wanting to see your values become reality in the world. You know, Gail and I don't have children, so I'm not looking at another generation for them, but I certainly have friends that have children. We have 10 nephews and nieces. You look at that world and what has been created in the United States, we're struggling with it because of philosophy, because of things that happened with German philosophers, you know, 100 years ago, more than that. And, you know, as David points out and Stephen Hicks points out in his postmodernism book, it nails it. If anybody had read that on there, you need to read that one. Amazing, but it makes the connection. So, so my support for the Al Society is to defend those values that I hold dear. And it's to do it because those are things I believe in and the things that it's again, that integrity position. I'm not gonna sit back and let the things I, the values I love dissipate or fail because of lack of my effort. And that's why I have stepped up and done this for so long and, and and also, I have to say, is to associate with people of like mind, to be in that community. I can't tell you how much being involved in this has meant to me and Gail both, to meet the caliber of people, to meet extraordinary people, to sit on the board with these extraordinary trustees. I mean, I'm honored every time I go in the room, every time we have a phone call. I'm happy to be at that table and add where I can because there's some brilliant folks on that, on that team. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of it. I mean, one of the things we didn't touch on was you know, David's area of expertise in epistemology. Yes. And, and, and I think you, you, te you teed up one question to me about epistemology is so abstract and how does it apply? You know, because ethics is really what we're focused on. Well, it's the link as we, Everybody on this call probably knows, you know, there's metaphysics and epistemology and epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge, but ethics comes from that. It's connected to reality through those earlier ones. Now the truth is the whole, but the way we build our intellectual model, it starts with metaphysics and then epistemology and how do we know? So it's the connection of ethics to reality. And as, as Stephen talks about in his book on postmodernism, what has happened is that there's been a break between the connection of ethics and, and realism and reality. And consequently, anything goes and it's a disaster. It happened in the 20th century with the Nazis and the communists and all the skepticism that came from that. And it's happening again here in the United States. So philosophy matters. 
it's important. It's a long game, but we have to commit to play it. Doesn't mean you don't play on the political side when you can and to the extent that's meaningful, but the real game is ideas. And that's what the Out Society does. And that's why it's so important. It's the best voice out there for fighting that fight. Well, on that, I think very optimistic note, I want to thank Frank, thank Gail, thank uh, everybody who joined us today for this live webinar. I wanna also thank those of you, and I see a few uh, who've stepped forward to support our work uh, as a nonprofit and wanted to remind you that our board has very generously offered to double match all new and increased uh, donations through the end of the year. We've already seen uh, just an incredible outpouring of generosity in response to that. And you know, as Frank says, it is a principle of, of justice. And um, I think that uh, also I do find a lot of people, you know, the lockdowns drag on, they start to get pessimistic. You know, they, they really start to just absorb all of the negativity uh, around them rather than looking for opportunity. And um, I guess I would say that no battle, no fight is ever truly lost until, you know, we say it is, let's be entrepreneurs. We can, we can do this and we can do it better with, with your support. So I appreciate that. So thank you, Frank. And uh, you, yeah. yeah, it's, it's great to see you. Appreciate uh, all of the time. And um, We'll talk soon. Everybody, please come back uh, next week. I will be in Washington, D.C., and um, I will be joined by Johan Norberg. We are going to be uh, on an hour earlier than um, usual because Johan is joining us from, from Sweden. And uh, goodbye, everybody. You want to say goodbye, Eric? Hi, guys, and bye-bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you.